Welcome to the Company of Dads podcast. I'm your host, Paul Sullivan, and today my guest is Drew Sullivan, a coach by training who pivoted a few years ago into specifically working with dads. He runs Connected Dads, which focuses on the four A's. More about that later. He's a director of Dad Central in Ontario and also the co-host of the Dad Central show. He's a father to three kids, twin daughters who are nine, and a son who is seven. He and his partner, who has a 12-year-old daughter, are expecting a child in the spring. Drew, welcome to the Company of Dads podcast. Thanks so much, Paul. It's great to be here. I'm really looking forward to the conversation. All right, let's talk about your 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 own uh, dad journey. Um, you did something that, you know, not uncommon, but not easy. You went from uh, zero kids to twins. Um, what was that like? You know, all of us have to have have a moment where we have to adjust to being parents. And I, I remember, you know, very well being so, so, so smug and thinking I had this thing figured out. And then of course I didn't, but that was just with one. What was it like, you know, with, with twins going from zero to twins? Yeah. Zero to twins. Oh, I think the best way I can describe it before we actually had them is I went and I told my, you know, a couple of good friends that, Hey, like not only are we pregnant, but we're having twins. Uh, they basically looked at me and said, you're, Effed. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. Thanks so much for that. Um, and, and those, are, I your, know what to and those are your friends. Those are your friends. Yeah, those are my friends. Your friends. Yeah. Let alone, okay, so, you know, it didn't necessarily have the best support going into it, thinking, well, it's going to be a good time. But um, in terms of how I adjusted to it, I think we were at the time very fortunate. We had a lot of good support. Uh, both sets of parents were relatively close or made the trips down to be close through that first three months, which most people, as we were getting ready to have, have the twins, who had twins, they said, you know, you can't really navigate it the first three months without like help. It's it's nearly impossible. And so right. we were we were fortunate to have some of that. So the adjustment, um, I think, was helped by having that support. And really, I was just so overjoyed. We actually had a difficult time um, getting pregnant. So it was two plus years. We were even at the point of going for IVF consult. Um, and we actually went, but we found out the two days before the appointment that my wife at the time was pregnant. And so anyway, so it was a surprising, uh, exciting yeah. time to know that, oh my goodness, not only are we now naturally pregnant, but we're actually having twins naturally. So that yeah. was you know overjoyed. And so that joy um, still main, maintained, even though that it was difficult um, yeah. to make the transition. But I think that helped us in those hard moments to look at each other and say, can we believe this? This is kind of a, yeah. a great blessing for us. And so let's keep that in mind. I remember, I think, within the first week of having them home, having them in like the cribs and actually asleep, uh, again, somewhat of a little bit of a miracle in those those first weeks, um, having them sleeping and just looking at them and being like, wow, it's a surreal moment that these two lives are now ours and they're here. And it, it's, I don't know how to accurately describe it, but it was, it was just a very powerful moment. And that, I think, in the hard times gets you through. When you think about how did it affect your your work? What were you, what were you doing professionally at the time to go from, again, you know, uh, the, the joy of being pregnant, have a wife who's pregnant, to, then having two kids and, and being, you know, everybody's overwhelmed, but being so overwhelmed. How did you balance, you know, work and, and fatherhood um, in those, you know, those first couple months or that, even that first year? Yeah. Well, at first I, I took some time off. Uh, I took a few weeks when the, the twins first came, then I went back to work and um, I think I'd, at that point, I'd been doing that role for probably f six years. And so I felt like I had developed a really good rhythm. Mm -hmm. um, and I was able to, you know, apply that that rhythm that I had to really be as efficient as possible. That role being a coach, is that correct? Yeah. So yeah, now the yeah. role I had at that time, I was, um, I was in uh, college athletics. Mm -hmm. So I actually worked as an administrator in, um, you know, in athletics and, and I oversaw um, our high, high performance varsity programs. And so... I'd established a good uh, rapport, good understanding, good relationships, and really knew the timelines and, and deadlines. And I was able to really uh, focus on getting ahead of those things. Because to yeah. me, I wanted to spend the time away from work, focused on work. And uh, they were born in February, which is kind of winding down most of the sports season. So by the time June, July rolled around, you know, there isn't much happening from 
I mean, there's more planning, but I was able to navigate uh, a lot of the administrative load um, through that time and or delegate some of it. So I, I had really good support from that perspective as well. Yeah. I listened to this. It sounds like this is, you know, one of the things we talk about with, with lead dads, um, that organization is, is key and, you know, calendaring is key, but it sounded like you were in a position and a role where, um, your, your job as much as possible was knowable and you could plan for things as opposed to at home with twins, which was completely, uh, chaos and unknowable. Is that, is that fair to say that, that kind of gave totally you, fair yeah. to say. Yeah. So, but then what happened then, you know, what you, you make it for the, through the first three months, uh, you make it through the first, you know, almost two years, then you have a third child. What, what was it like that you, you missed the chaos? Is that it? Or you wanted to see what would happen when you, you, you threw a boy into the mix with, with, with twin girls? Yeah, absolutely. No. Well, you know what? It was interesting. I remember be, my twins being about a year, year and a half old, and they were starting, you know, they start to get more active, more involved. They're, they're freer, like they can go yeah. and do things, getting into trouble. And that can be challenging. But I actually missed that, like, early baby stage. I'm like, you remember those times when you just, like, pick them and hold them and cuddle them? They, they wouldn't go anywhere. They wouldn't do anything. Yeah, that's not really happen now. And so... Come on, Drew. You're, you're a big, I, strong guy. You can still pick up the nine-year-old and the seven-year-old. I have no I doubt. I still do. They're all over <laughs> me all the time. Daddy, we want to play horses. So, yes, it still happens. But, you know, that for me, I think um, I always wanted to have a son. Yeah. And um, it's not like we were consciously not trying. It's not like we were consciously trying. But when I found out that uh, my wife was pregnant again, it just felt like a, a another huge blessing. And so we didn't find out until he, he was born because we just waited for the surprise and found out he, yeah. it was a son. And so um, it was just uh, it was the next evolution of our family, I think, yeah. at that point in time. And that's just that's just what it meant. And it, it prompted some changes for me, it prompted some changes for my wife at the time. And, um, you know change usually requires a lot of work and effort and, and some sometimes the unexpected. And so, that, I mean, it was, the reason was really, it's just life evolving and, yeah. and happening. And we enjoyed twins. We enjoyed the, like just being parents. And so let's continue growing our family. Talk to me about the decision you made professionally, the change you made professionally. You, you've got these years under your belt uh, as, as a father, but also as a, as an athletic coach. But then it was about 2019, pre-pandemic, you decided to go out on your own and be a coach specifically for dads. So talk to me about how uh, your work in athletics and also your experience as a father uh, informed that decision and, and continued to inform the the work you're doing with other fathers. Yeah, that's a great question. I think really the roots of that come from my own childhood experience. So when I was three, I was abducted by my biological father. And so for four years, um, I was with him as he essentially ran from, you know, the law or ran from my mom. Um, you know, we lived in New York city. We lived in Jamaica. We lived in St. Louis, Missouri. And all that time, my mom was basically trying to get me home because she had custody. Mm -hmm. So, um, that did you experience, know it was going, did you know what was going on? Did you, or you were just as a, a child, do you or? know what's going on? You do, but you don't. Right. Right. Um, so, I mean, I was aware at a certain point in time, probably when I was in, I'd say Jamaica, like this, where's my mom? I, I don't know where she is. I'm just here with, with my dad. And then this whole night. So you just, this is life. You don't really know any, I didn't know any different, I guess, at that point in time. And did so, you ask him, did you ask your dad, like where, where's mom or? I don't know. You don't know. I don't, I can't consciously remember asking him. Yeah. Um. I just remember experiencing, you know, this, this new life without my mom. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't have that many memories. I have a few select events that I remember from probably like three till five and then a little bit more of like six and seven in St. Louis, right, which is where we lived. Yeah. So that experience and then getting returned to my mom legally, she got the laws changed in the state of Missouri uh, with the help of two amazing people. Uh, and then the, basically the state came, seized me. I spent three days in foster homes while they were sorting out the stuff in court. And next thing you know, I'm in reintroduced this woman who I vaguely recognized um, as my mom, but it, obviously I didn't know her. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so then I returned home. And so then I spent the next, you know, however many years growing up and. Um, but you returned you know, home to a place that was your home before you abducted, but you don't have any memories because from three to seven, I mean, New York, Jamaica, St. Louis, I mean, like you couldn't be three more different, you know, places. So you're this Canadian who's been kind of moving around. Then you go back. And then I, I presume your father is, 
his biological father is in jail for doing this. No, oh. he, he didn't. Uh, there were no laws about child parent child abduction um, back in 1983 when all this okay. happened. Um, and so, and also ultimately my mom chose when the authorities came to her afterwards, um, not to press any charges. Mm -hmm. Um, so, uh, she, that was, it was move on with life essentially. Right. Yeah. So, um, no, my, so that didn't, that didn't happen to my father. Um, right. yeah. So but, I keep so that experience. You as I ask this question, yeah, that experience and how it informed what you're going to do as a, as right. A, so that experience. And then growing up, you know, have feeling this void as much as my father did that. I mean, he still loved me um, imperfectly as, as most parents are. Um, and I still long to have my father in my life. I wanted him to see me play sports. I wanted him to be on the sidelines and you say, hey, I'm proud of you, son. I wanted all of those things. I had a wonderful stepfather who came into life from the time I was 10, but mm -hmm. I still wanted my father. And so when I was becoming a father, um, I just felt this strong passion and desire to be the best father I could be and change the experience for my children than what I experienced. And so I think um, to get to the answer to your actual first question is that whole journey that started way back when really came to a head in about after my son was born mm -hmm. and life got really difficult. The relationship became very difficult. There were a lot, a couple deaths in our family. Mm -hmm. There was a move to a new home. There was um, my wife selling her business, you know, having to come up with a whole new identity. There was so many significant life challenges that I just, I did everything I could to hold the family and hold the relationship and hold everything together. It just wore me out. And I saw everything happening around me that wasn't the way that I wanted it to be or that I hoped it to be. Mm -hmm. And so out of that pain and struggle, I just dug deeper into this idea of, well, like, how am I going to make this reality come true and i know that i can't do it on my own so part of my thought was the more that i connect with like-minded men who mm -hmm. are ahead of me maybe or who are you know doing the things through these type of challenges that i may not be able to do the better that we'll all be and right. so and plus i had a passion for leadership and developing leaders and i become part of the john maxwell leadership program where I'm coaching and training people in how to lead. And so I thought, well, where is it more important to lead? Right. To lead that than at yeah. home. Yeah. First leading yourself first, then leading at home and then leading in the rest of your life. And so that's really the genesis of how I came to, you know, create connected dads, yeah. which then led to a, a lot of the other things and brought me to, you know, where we are today as far as you know, what I'm, what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And what was that like for you sort of identity wise to go from, you know, the world of athletics or the world of training, you know, leaders, presumably in the corporate setting to essentially, um, you know, focusing on, on, on fathers and getting them to acknowledge the, the, the need to, to, to reach out to, to other men, to get advice. You know, I always joke about, I, I've only watched the movie at age 13. So I would like to see, you know, how does the movie keep going? That's how you learn. Like we can look back and give advice to people, with younger kids, but how did that, how did that work? And, and, you know, talk to me about some of the breakthroughs you made in, in coaching men who really warmed to the idea of fatherhood as a, as a team sport. Mm, yeah. Well, that's a great term. Fatherhood as a team sport. But when you're coaching fathers and men to, to be, you know, leaders of themselves or leaders of their families, you know, I'd love to know about some, some breakthrough moments that, that you remember from, from those early mm. days of connected dads. Yeah. I think most of the breakthrough moments really come over this shared connection um, of like what it's like to either fail as a dad and feel the pain of that, that failure and really not want that to happen in your life or um, through a shared experience of, you know, we're really going through this hard time, um, but here's what's actually, you know, gotten me through. And they can really relate to the fact that it's been so hard. I'm like, yeah, you know what? Uh, it's hard for me as well. So I think the breakthrough is that bringing real conversations to the table mm -hmm. when most men are socialized to just not talk about it, not deal with it, and just like suck it up and make it through. And so that to me is where the, the real powerful moments come in and they're like, you know what, I'm actually, that's the, some, the same thing that I go through, but I never know anyone else was going through that. And so, okay, it's okay for me to actually maybe feel some of these feelings and, and then be able to have a practical 
um, way forward. Mm -hmm. And that's how we've built some of the content and how we uh, have the conversations on the Dad Central show. Yeah, but with Connected Dads, did it work better uh, on a one-on-one, -on -one, you and a, and a dad, that, that type of relationship or did it work better in you know as i'd say like you know a team setting you and i don't know half a dozen dads a dozen yeah. dads i think it works both okay. i wouldn't say one's better than the other i think the uh, ability to have group can be very powerful um and can you know um allow deeper relationships to form among more men um the benefit of the one-on-one -on -one is that there's you may be a little bit more uh, safety and security for yeah. somebody who's really not willing to share in a group format or, you know, or really needs to be challenged, but not challenged in front of anyone else where they're not going to be able to be respond to that challenge in a productive, constructive way. They're going to respond in a negative way. And so that's, there's some unique elements of both can be very beneficial. Now I can't let you, I can't pivot to the next subject without you talking about the, the four A's. Uh, what, yeah. what are they and uh, how do you apply them? Yeah, the four A's are, you know, after going through my own challenges, figuring out my own coaching style, my own coaching philosophy, but also really what what brings change, like what creates the transformation that I'm looking to support people in, in achieving, and that's what they are. So the four A's are awareness, mm -hmm. alignment, activation, and accountability. And so yeah. I'll go through it. So yeah. awareness is, you know, John Maxwell's quote is, you know, you must know yourself to grow yourself. So if you don't know and understand yourself, your skills, your strengths, you know, I've got these, this thing, you know, the five P's, what, you know, what are your priorities, what's your personality, you know, uh, some of those th elements need to be understood. And then from there, then you create alignment between your, who you this, are. This is who you are as a human and this who is you what are, you're capable of. Yeah. And what matters to you and you create alignment in terms of your decisions. You align your actions, your thoughts, your ideas with the goals and aspirations that you're wanting to achieve because if you if, and that starts from awareness so you got to see it first then you got okay look what do i put the pieces in, in place and then you have to act when i say activation it's really about thoughts you know thoughts are really the drivers of feelings and feelings are how we all make decisions mm -hmm. despite the most logical rational person there's always emotion that drives that's why that's what marketers know that's why they tap into emotion to sell you stuff because that's how everyone makes decisions. And so, but that all starts with the right. Have thoughts. you been looking at my Instagram account over my shoulder and, and why I buy all this golf merchandise in, in the dead of winter? Is that, do you know that? You're the, their ideal customer. I am. And they know you so well. <laughs> they they just me. tap into that. Yeah. So those, so that's the activation. What are the yeah. thoughts that you have? And I think many of the dads that I've worked with, they struggle with these um, self um, negative, negative self-talk. Mm -hmm. And they carry thoughts of, I can't do it. I've messed up or, you know, um, this isn't for me. Or it, sometimes I have a victim mentality that, you know, well, I never had a dad. I never, and so they struggle with thinking the right thoughts that are then going to move them forward. And then the, the last part is accountability. Mm -hmm. Accountability is, uh, I think, critical. Uh, as, uh, as I have it on, on the Connected Dad site, you know, the, the American College of Training basically says that, when you have a specific accountability goal with one other person, you are 95% more likely to achieve that goal. Yeah. So when you're able to set a target for yourself and have that accountability with someone else, the, the chances are you're, you're probably going to get there as opposed to if you just kind of do it on your own. And so that's the whole idea of, you know, coming together in community. Yeah. In your, in the, as I can ask in your, your, your coaching methodology, do you, is it a partnering system or a buddy system where these dads have a mentor of some sort or are they accountable to you? No. So the way that I structure it is that we help you create your own accountability structure. And then we help you establish what it is you want to be held accountable for. And you can either do that with anyone who's in the group with your coach specifically or you can identify a, a part person in your life who is trusted, who is going to be your accountability partner. Mm -hmm. And then it's about you creating that accountability for yourself because we're not here to hold your hand. You're an adult. And coaching is about helping an individual identify the strength and resources they have within, not yeah. me doing it for them. Sure, so that's yeah. the philosophy behind the accountability is it's created um, by the individual themselves. Yeah, helping people be more inner directed to the goals that they want to accomplish yes. versus being more outer directed where they need to be told again and yep. again. That's fascinating. Um, 
pivot back to the, you know, personal, uh, you know, seven years, you're, you're a married dad and, and, you know, during the pandemic 2021, you and your wife separate and you become a, a separated dad and, you know, company of dad statistics, you know, 18% of fathers in the United States at least are either divorced separated uh, or widowed. So it's a, a big component of the 25 million men who make up lead dads in America. Um, I don't, we don't need to go into sort of the, the, the marriage part, but, but talk to me about how it, it, it changed your way as a father and the way you're able to, to parent and, and the dadding that you're able to do once you, you separate it from, from your wife. Well, fundamentally it didn't actually change mm my parenting all it did is um i saw the great need that my children had through a time that brought them so much pain and mm -hmm. confusion yeah. and i needed to um i need to make the most difficult choices i could make um and work as hard as i could for them um so it really just it just accelerated my uh, my focus on my kids even more um through that time and, and through the time that they're still going through so um it, it really it's just i'll try and summarize it by saying i think i'm an even better father now than i was before and i was a really good father then and why do you think that is because presumably you you don't have them a hundred percent of the time now so why why is it that you feel you're a better father now than than you were before because the separation itself freed me from a lot of the uh, toxicity that was in the life, in my life. And it caused me to go even deeper into like this aspect of personal healing. And so, you know, the, the most important um, thing you, as a parent is really just to manage yourself. Mm -hmm. And so if nothing else, I had, I was forced even more to dig into the healing myself because of the amount of pain that I was going through. And, um, and I knew that I didn't want that to come out onto my kids, um, because they were innocent. They had nothing to do with this. Um, mm -hmm. it wasn't about them at all. And they had no understanding what was going, what they were going through. And so I needed to, you know, protect them and I needed to nurture them and I needed to guide them and I needed to model for them all the things that, uh, a healthy person needs to do to get through adversity. Mm -hmm. And that was really, I think my priority. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're talking at the very beginning of the year, this, this podcast will, will air in a couple of weeks time, but you know, it, the statistics show people often go through the holidays and, and divorce uh, spikes after the holiday. Uh, um, which I guess is understandable. If you, if you're having problems and you spend all this time with a person and you think, hmm, maybe I don't want to do this anymore. When you think about uh, this post, you know, the early 2023, what advice do you have for, you know, men who either uh, find themselves as, as divorced dads or have been divorced dads for a while? I guess two-part question. have been divorced dads for a while and want to be better, better fathers and, and, and kind of, you know, like as you said in your way, like remove themselves from that toxicity. So the separation between, you know, being a, uh, an ex-husband and, and being a, a, a father, you know, when you think of those two things, you know, guys who may find themselves being divorced and, and guys who've been divorced for a while who, who want to be better fathers, what are some of the tips that you have for them? Yeah. Well, the reality is divorce is just extremely painful. Um, no matter how it happens. Um, I mean, even if you're the most amicable, like there's a loss there you're losing something there and you've invested a lot uh, a lot of yourself into that and so my most important learning for me personally and i think is valuable is that you have to feel the actual pain of what you're going through in order to move through it i think what happens and can be very detrimental is that you uh, try and ignore it deny it stuff it medicate it um, avoid it and then you never really get the, the full healing that you need to be able to free yourself and move on in a healthy way with the rest of your life. So counterintuitive, but like go through the pain, like feel the pain. I remember many days falling to my knees and 
having the most painful, like gut wrenching, like cry fest because the pain was so intense of what I was going through. The loss of my children, the, 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 the loss of, you know, this vision of a life that I had been working so hard to create. It, it sucked. Uh, I hated it. I remember many times yelling out to people like, I never wanted this for my life, but choosing to go through that pain ultimately freed me to be in a much healthier place, to connect with my children when they need me, to not have that pain come out when I'm triggered because my daughter is like their mother. You know, I can just calmly, patiently, lovingly respond to her as opposed to react because I still have that pain locked away. So to me, that is the most important work. It's not a tip. It's it's the hard work, hard work of yeah. getting as healthy as you can be to be able to be your best and for there for other people. But I mean, obviously getting healthy, that, that wasn't something that you're able to do in a day, a week, a month. It, it took mm -hmm. time. It's surely something you're still working on now, but your kids need you as a dad. And you know, there's only so much you can share with nine-year-olds and seven-year-olds. And you, you don't want to throw their mom under the bus. You don't want to be thrown under the bus yourself. How do you, you know, sort of almost bifurcate the, the pain you're feeling as a person and a human with your obligation or your love as, as a father. You have to get really good at compartmentalizing mm. and you have to get really good at managing yourself in those moments. And you have to understand what you need to be able to not have that happen. Don't get me wrong. It's not going to, I'm not, I wasn't perfect. Still not perfect at it. There'll be moments, but then you got to forgive yourself. So for me, you know, if I was triggered, I'd be like, okay, I would recognize it. And then, okay, I'm, I'm feeling pretty frustrated right now. I'm going to walk away. So I walk away, get my head, where I need it to be, take a couple of deep breaths, whatever technique I needed to not have it come out, I would do. Sometimes that meant, okay, I could see things aren't going well here. All right, we're going out, we're going for a hike. Let's go. We're going for, and getting outside helps me, getting outside helps the kids. So sure. finding and understanding, you know, the things that you need to manage yourself, I think of, from my perspective are the most valuable. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, your, your, your fatherhood journey is, is so interesting to me and it's, it's a, it's a complex one. I mean, you're about to become uh, a father again. So you, you will be a, a you know, father from your first marriage. You, you will, you're having you, you and your partner are having a baby uh, due in April. Um, she has a daughter from uh, her, her relationship. That's a lot of fathering. How do you, you know, how have you prepared yourself uh, for, you know, fathering at different levels for, for, you know, five, five children. You just do it. It's not a great <laughs> you sound answer. sound like a Nike ad. Yeah. yeah. Sound just like do Nike it. Ad. Exactly. Does Nike yeah. make shoes for that? Does Nike have they like should. special like fathering sneakers you know or that's, something that's like that? That's our new shirt for on dad shunts for now. Right? Just do it. That's <laughs> just, it. Just do it. You know, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a fair question. It's all for me. It's all about growth. Um, you know, you, you think of the compound interest principle. I know you're a little bit of a wealth guy, right? So, you know, you, you, you know, you take a penny and you double it for 31 days, you know, how much you get? Well, it's not until the 29th day when it's like up to 5 million. And then yeah. at like the 30th day, it's like, oh, it's over, it's $10 million. But it started as a penny. It's the same type of principle in terms of to prepare myself as a father. I just take the moments or the days and I keep adding to them. I keep learning. I keep growing. I keep investing. I keep trying because I'm going to keep making mistakes. And so that's really the fundamental approach that I have is just how do I... You know, my um, university football coach, yeah, number 30, that was me. My football coach, he, he's actually in the CFL Hall of Fame. That's Canadian football, I know. Sorry, yeah. it's not, not, not NFL, <laughs> but Canadian Football Hall of Fame. He would say, "What? can you imagine how good we would be if collectively we each got just 1% better every day? Sure. And I just take that philosophy and I apply it. You know, how do I get 1% better today as a dad? How do I get 1% better today as a husband? How do I get 1% better today as, you know, uh, a, a leader? How, how do I do that? And it's just that approach for me is how you prepare yourself. You just keep learning and growing. You know, everybody's career is a, is a work in progress. Hopefully we're learning. Uh, that's how we grow. But, you know, coaches, it's, it's an obvious, you know, path. It's almost like an apprentice structure. You know, nobody starts out as the uh, head head football coach, the New York Giants. You you, you work your way up from uh, other things and you get there. You as a coach of fathers, what have you learned from some of the men who've who've been on your your fatherhood team, on your squad with you about fathering challenges that you can now apply 
um, to your, your, your soon to be in a blended family. What have they taught you that, that you've taken away? Yeah. I think they've taught me the importance of having fun and not being so serious. Uh, they've taught me the importance. Wait, wait, you're of, not you're not one of those coaches that doesn't yell at people, right? I thought all coaches yell. Well, what, what, there's no there's fun in football, is there? So if you go back to the athletic coaching days, I was not a yeller, you not know. a yeller. Yeah, I, however, yeller. if I did yell, you knew you something was going on. <laughs> you really so, okay. if nothing else, it was used um, uh, ex- efficiently when yeah. I needed it to be effective. So, um, but yeah, the importance of patience. Um, mm-hmm. And, and that fun piece is, is something that I continually strive. And my kids are really great at that. Actually, almost they coach me on it, but yeah, from the other men who are in, you know, the part of the team, um, there, I actually actively seek out more. I, I seek out, you know, people who have strengths in areas that I'm not as strong. Um, you know, those who are, you know, gifted in the area of, of health and fitness, you know, I, I kind of seek them out. So yes, there's the, you know, that inner circle I say of the, those I can rely on, I can go to. Uh, but then it's like, who else is out there learning things uh, or has things that I can learn from them? And so it's a combination of leverage what I have and find new connections who can offer value as well and support me. And I can this, support them too. Yeah, this has been great, Drew. Um, before we go, talk a bit about Dad Central and your work there, what Dad Central means for for dads in, in Canada and, and also your show. Just talk a bit about what your your focus on there. Yeah. Thanks for that. Well, Dad Central, um, you know, our vision is that there's an involved um, active father in every child's life. And, you know, the way we do that is we we produce um, training and resources. So training for those who work with fathers and families. And then we produce resources for fathers specifically on most of, you know, kind of the fatherhood experience. And so, mm-hmm. um, you know, we've been built off of research on a positive, positively involved fathers and the impact that has on child development. So really, yes, we're dad central, but it's all about how do we raise healthy, successful, confident children and dads play a huge role as validated by research. And so our goal is to, you know, spread that message. I think far and wide that dads make a huge difference and to encourage, empower um, dads to step into that role and feel confident in that and also see the reward and benefit for the kids. So Dad Central produces, as you said, resources. And, you know, our newest one is the Dad Central Show. It's a podcast mm-hmm. where we uh, coach dads to be their best, um, both in their lives, but uh, especially for their their kids so that they can help them grow to be confident and successful. And so um, it's really just a, an honor and a privilege to be able to really live my own growth journey out and then share it with others and or connect and uh, promote it with others. So it's a real, real honor to be able to do that. And so thank you for, for this, Paul. I really appreciate it. All right, I, I lied. I, that was going to be my last question, but I can't let you go with that. You're such a, a wealth of knowledge here. How do you think, you know, you work with dad central or your, 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 your coaching work with fathers. How has the, the, the pandemic and, and the sort of change way that, that we as men, as humans work, how do you think that's changed father or has it changed have you noticed changes to how people are are fathering post post pandemic well it's a great question my initial thoughts are it kind of accelerated what i thought was already happening mm. and it's tied in with this idea of and bear with me as i try and get the right way to capture it, but the idea of um I'm not tied to my like work as my identity and you know the great resignation I say is like people are starting to reflect like crisis causes people to reflect mm-hmm. and then they make decisions okay is this really in line with what I want or not and so I think there's been a lot of rethinking of like what matters what's important and and so I think that you know fathers and then fathers have also been thrust into this being at home seeing in the reality of what maybe mo- their partners have been dealing with for many many years and they didn't realize it so there's some of that reflection that's going on so i think it's changed um it, it's it was already starting to happen as far as i think fathers were you know feeling this desire to be involved um, but didn't necessarily have the broader support for it whereas now yeah. i think there's broader support that's tied in with this cultural shift that has been brought on by the pandemic. So, uh, which is a good thing. It's, it's really positive to see more, you know, we see on LinkedIn, so many more dads posting photos of, you know, dad with the newborn dad with the kids speaking yeah. about it from their perspective, the value, like there's just so much more of that. Whereas, you know, before 
nobody would have nobody even thought about that so there's some really positive things happening i'd say and i think w from our data you know dads really care about their fatherhood role and they want to be active and involved parents and so now if there's more conversation there's more support there's more systems in place to actually make that happen then that's a real wonderful thing Drew Solon, Connected Dads, Dad Central. Thank you for being my guest today on the Company of Dads podcast. Thank you, Paul. Real honor.